So welcome everybody. I can see you coming. If, uh, many of you have come in from the waiting room. Uh, I'm Nicola Barrett, Chief Corporate Learning Officer at Emory Executive Education at Goiswata Business School. And thank you for joining us all today. If you're like most executives, it's hard to imagine a more challenging time in business. In the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic, businesses are facing challenges, challenges of economic uncertainty, uh, heightened geopolitical tensions, environmental issues. In addition, we're grappling with um, the imperative of AI and digital transformation. And we've got challenges and had challenges and continue to have challenges about finding, engaging, and keeping great people, especially given the changes in um, expectations, the transition to remote work for some of us, the transition back into the office, and then also talent shortages. We believe that providing your employees with an opportunity to learn and grow is a key to attracting and retaining great employees. And without growth opportunities, you risk losing your best employees and keeping your worst ones. To help us explore this uh, today, we have um, a Jamie Turner, adjunct professor at Goiswater Business School, to share some insights from a recent research study, uh, the Leadership Lab, Guiding the Next Generation of Workplace Stars, about the importance of leadership development in the corporate world. The survey was conducted with uh, 204 uh, high-level executives, including many of you on this Business Over Breakfast um, webinar, uh, and it uncovered leadership trends and best practices in North America, Latin America, and Europe. And we've had Jamie on before, but just to remind you, uh, Jamie teaches in um, across uh, Goizueta in, in our executive education uh, courses, MBA and undergraduate programs. Uh, he's an internationally recognized author, workshop leader, uh, contributor to CNN, uh, and he teaches marketing, customer experience and leadership. He was born in London, hence he's probably, um, well, if you come from uh, New Zealand or Australia, barracking for, for England, you'd be rooting for England. Um, he loves to travel um, and has been to 33, has been overseas on 33 separate occasions. I keep thinking I need to look at my passports and see if I beat you on, on Jamie. Yeah. <laughs> um, so for the for this morning, for the, our webinar, Jamie's going to spend about the first 40 minutes or so sharing insights and perspectives on the, on the survey, um, what came out of the survey, um, followed by an open Q&A. But please do put your, your questions in the chat and the Q&A, and we will answer them along the way. Um, so we'll make this as interactive as possible. If this area is of interest to you, and I, if you're tuning in, I'm, I'm sure it is, um, just be aware of a couple of upcoming opportunities, one around disrupting your business strategy. And this is really a program that is focusing on how do you lead a more agile organization so that you're the one disrupting your business strategy, developing it, tweaking it, um, rather than your competition um, disrupting your business strategy. Um, plus, also, we have, um, we're accepting applications for our MBA level uh, courses. So these are electives that you would learn alongside our working professionals. That's our evening and executive MBAs. It is for credit, for university credit, um, and they cover uh, areas of marketing uh, and organization and management. So I'm going to hand it over to you, Jamie, and look forward to um uh, hearing what uh, the survey came up with. Terrific. Thank you, Nicola. Sure do appreciate it. Uh, and thank you for opening up the chat. So we now have chat as well as Q&A opened up, but we'll be using the chat feature uh, pretty regularly here. On your screen right now, you see something that says Leadership Lab. Uh, right now, you should be seeing something that says the agenda. We're just going to go through a few things here. I'm going to talk about new data on office culture, workforce dynamics, and employee satisfaction. New data on the Leadership Development Research Report that uh, I conducted with Dr. 
Dr. Jesse Conyers and Emory Executive Education, and then new insights to help you become a better leader, manager, or mentor. So if you're interested in information about how to get the best from your employees, you're in the right place. If you're interested in how to learn how to do a better job leading yourself so that you can lead others, you're in the right place. Uh, and if you're just interested in being part of the Emory Executive Education community here, every uh, Thursday we do these business over breakfast uh, seminars and they're a great way to kind of stay in touch with your folks. Please ask questions during the presentation. I will be monitoring the chat feature primarily. Uh, I'll look at the Q&A, but mostly on the chat feature. So if you have a question, feel free to do that there. But let's kick things off by getting to know one another. Uh, I'm going to stop sharing here real quickly, open up another part of my screen. Give me a second here. And we will open that guy up and do the share screen and on your screen right now. This is kind of a fun way to get to know one another because part of my job as a, as a speaker is to not only have a dialogue with you, but for you to get to know one another. So I'm gonna spin the wheel here. And then what I'd like you to do in the chat feature is go ahead and write down the answer to the question in the spinning wheel. So let's kick things off with, okay, here's a good one. Little strange for a morning session, but what's the strangest food you've ever eaten? Go ahead and put that in the chat feature. It's just a way to warm everybody up. My strangest food is I once had lamb's brain ravioli, probably the wrong thing to be talking about early in the morning, but it actually wasn't so bad. So we got cow skin, interesting, cooked worm in South Africa, a fascinating alligator, beet juice, uh, natto. William, tell us what natto is. I'd be curious if you can add to that. Escargot, great. Dave in uh, de, uh, up at uh, Seminarium uh, or uh, uh, Censerian uh, did termites. Uh, octopus, interesting, fascinating. So now we get to know each other. Let's do one more spin real quickly as we get to know one another, just to kind of wake you up and, and sort of get you going. Uh, Okay, if you had to give up pizza or ice cream for the rest of your life, which one would you give up? I would give up ice cream. Wow, everybody would give up ice cream. That is fascinating. Oh my goodness. I, you know, I'm with y'all. I mean, it's gotta be 90% of the people here saying they would give up ice cream. You know what? We're on a roll. Let's do one more spin because this has been kind of fun and it's a way to get to know each other and wake up, wake us up. So uh, let's talk about this one. What's the farthest place you've ever traveled? We've got a lot of people from North America, but we've got people from overseas. I saw somebody from Jamaica, uh, England, Prague, beautiful place. Egypt, one of my favorite places, believe it or not. India, uh, bottom of South America, interesting. Hong Kong, Korea, fascinating. Jerusalem, my favorite city on the planet. Not kidding you. It's an amazing place. If you haven't gotten there, uh, be sure to get there. Bayonne, New Jersey. Stephen, awesome. I uh, spent my summers on the Jersey Shore in Bayhead, uh, New Jersey, just uh, south of Point Pleasant. Morocco, another famous, uh, wonderful place. Uh, Denise, Greece is the one place I have never been to. I've been all over the world, but never been there. So let's keep going. I'm going to share my screen again with you, and we're going to talk about uh, other things other than getting to know one another. The question I have for you, and this is again a chat feature thing, why is leadership development important? Why are we talking about leadership development? Let me define it while you're thinking up your answer. Leadership development is the, the job of somebody to go in at an organization and develop the leaders internally and train employees and improve their performance. Let's see what our chat says here. Why is leadership development important? Securing our future, good growth, uh, wonderful personal and professional growth. Uh, most leaders don't inspire. They need key experiences to live. Uh, the behavior's great, have engaged employees, awesome. Uh, ensuring the next generation of leaders, Nina says, Suzette says, without uh, direction, we cannot achieve uh, what we want to. And then Catherine says, leader behaviors have a strong impact on the engagement of employees, which is really, really important. So on the screen right now, let's take a look at some old school leadership and talk about briefly why this style doesn't work anymore. Henry Ford, of course, early 20th century. In 1913, Ford had 15,000 employees on his payroll, but 52,000 workers were hired and then quit in that year alone, an attrition rate of 370%. Why did that happen? Well, 
First of all, uh, Ford wanted to combat his attrition. He doubled employees' salaries in order to keep him. But he also created the Ford Sociological Department with 200 investigators. Investig investigators would show up unannounced at your home just to make sure it was being kept clean and other things. It's safe to say that that style of leadership wouldn't work today. So we're in a new era, of course. The Henry Ford style wouldn't work. Earlier in my career, I had the pleasure of working with my father. He was a successful successful executive, but he definitely had a top down approach to things. He did work with P&G and other companies, but it was a very top down approach. It was like, here's the dictate and everybody executes. Now it's much more amorphous where we're actually engaging employees so that we can get them engaged with the thought process, the thinking and the action steps. And that's a little bit of what we're going to talk about uh, today. So let's start with some science of leadership. Uh, first of all, employee satisfaction is higher in companies with strong leadership. 70% of employees are engaged when they have a manager who is focused on their development. And by the way, the more interest you show in your employees' development, the more those employees will work hard for your corporation. Second bullet point, employee satisfaction is higher in companies that invest in employee well-being. Companies that invest in employee well-being see a return on investment of up to four to one. So you really get a return on an investment when you get Emory Executive Education to come into your program, into your corporation and do uh, leadership development things, uh, programs, that's a four to one return on investment. And that's been proven out statistically and with reliable data. Also, employee satisfaction is positively correlated with customer satisfaction. Companies with high customer satisfaction course, scores also have high employee satisfaction scores. So you see some of the science behind leadership there. Well, let's keep going. Employee satisfaction is influenced by a variety of factors. So if you're trying to, infl to have satisfied employees, they will be satisfied by the following things. Compensation and benefits, managerial support, company culture, work-life balance, job security, recognition, and rewards. All of those things are important. But what happens when we give somebody a raise we give an employee a raise, their satisfaction bumps up, but it's temporary. It bumps up for about three months and then it goes back to its set point. So things like compensation and benefits, they'll bump up employee satisfaction fine for about three months. After that, it drops back down. So the solution is that even though all of these things are important, they're not as important as the opportunity for growth. And I'm gonna pause here for a second and just really stress that. If you want satisfied employees over the long run, and I'm talking about for the entire time that you have your company or are working in that company, employee development is the number one thing you can do in order to increase employee satisfaction, employee engagement. Why is that? Because everybody has self-interest in mind. Every one of your employees is interested in improving themselves, whether it's through programs that you do, through uh, leadership development uh, uh, training sessions, all of those things add up to important things for your employees. So keep that in mind as you go through all of this, that employee development is important. So the starting point for good leadership, if you want to be a good leader, and I know we've got a lot of people in here who want to be great leaders, whether it's uh, William or Cynthia or uh, Dave or Pam uh, or any of the folks in the chat feature who are contributing in the, in the chat feature, all of you probably want to be a better leader, either doing a better job leading yourself, but certainly doing a better job leading others. So how do you do that? Well, the starting point is self-awareness, is understanding who you are as a leader so that you can then go ahead and do it. I'm going to have everybody do something here. What yeah, I'd like Jamie, to Jamie yeah. can I just uh, interject for a moment? There's a question in the, the Q&A about what do you mean by well-being? Do you mean oh, good. health, personal issues? Excellent. And thank you, Nicola, for, for, and I encourage everybody keep on asking the questions and Nicola is going to, is going to sort of chime in and say, Hey, we got a, an important question. I think that's an important question. Uh, mostly well-being is about mental uh, and physical well-being in the workplace. We all know that stress is an growing issue in our culture, not only just our broader culture, but also in our corporate culture. So the more that we can do to manage stress 
and ease things up and make uh, working in the workplace more enjoyable. Not only does that improve longevity, you know, physical longevity for employees, but it improves longevity of engagement with that employee at your company. And it also improves productivity. In fact, there's new research that was just mentioned in the Wall Street Journal that the idea of putting in 85% effort now instead of 100%. Now, that I am not talking about soft quitting or whatever it's called, quiet quitting. I'm talking about taking your foot off the gas pedal. It's okay to have your foot on the gas pedal as a worker, as an employee, as a manager, occasionally at 100%. But if you're going to get long-term engagement and productivity, studies have shown that when you kind of back off and put in about 85% and don't do the weekend work and don't do the evening work all the time, that will end up resulting in better employee engagement and employee well-being. So let me jump back to the slide at hand, which is the starting point for good leadership is self-awareness. What I'd like everybody to do right now is I want you to draw, take your dominant hand, if you're lefty, left hand, righty, right hand, take your dominant hand and I want you to draw the letter Q on your forehead. I'm going someplace with this. So just draw the letter Q on your forehead. And by now, you've probably drawn the letter Q. Now, what I want you to think about is, did the tail of the Q come down over your left eye or did it come down over your right eye? So just think about that because there's a study done by Dr. Richard Weissman out of the United Kingdom that shows where you drew the cue can give you an indicator of what kind of person you are. And again, the point I'm making here with this exercise is self-awareness is a starting point for good leadership. So what I want you to do is think about whether you were on the left side, the tail of the cue on the left side or the tail of the cue on the right Right side. Go ahead and put it in the chat feature. We've got people going in. Paula is left. David is right. Yulia, good to see you, Yulia, uh, from UPS. Wonderful to have you here. Uh, Connor is left. Awesome. Now, I'm going to tell you what that means because it actually means something. And this is based on a study by Dr. Richard Weissman out of the United Kingdom. This isn't just uh, crazy, fluffy stuff. If you drew the letter Q, so that the tail comes down on the right side so that you can read it. That means you're more self-focused. And there's nothing wrong with either answer here, by the way. So don't worry about being labeled as self-focused. Uh, if you drew the letter Q so that you can read it, you're the same person in different situations. It means you kind of have a lot of uh, uh, stability in how you go through your life. You're guided by your own values rather than the needs of others. You pride yourself on being straight with people. And you're not especially good at lying, but you're better at detecting lies in others. Now, if you drew the Q so that the tail came down on the left side, that means you drew it so that other people can read it. It means you're other focused. You're thoughtful about how other people see you. You're happier being the focus of other people's attention. You can easily adapt your behavior to suit the situation in which you find yourself. And you might be good at lying, but not very good at detecting lies. So this is just a sort of a gimmicky study designed to help you understand yourself. Is it 100% accurate? No. And are we trying to label people? No. We're just saying, hey, the starting point for good leadership is having self-awareness. And if that little exercise can help you go, oh, I might be more self-focused or I might be more other focused. That's the starting point for good leadership because it'll help you move through your career and become a better leader. So let's keep going here. We're going to uh, back on the screen here and go ahead and jump down to the next slide. So the key point here is high self-awareness ultimately results in better leadership. So try to stay uh, uh, as uh, self-aware as you possibly can. And Melody in the chat feature says, uh, her daughter laughed at me recently because the gibbets on my Crocs were put on so others could read versus so I could read. So that's interesting. Very fascinating there. Uh, Melody, thanks for sharing that. Let's keep going. Let's talk about the 2023 annual leadership development research report uh, presented to you by Emory Executive Education, uh, which does this every year as a way to provide you with information that you can use uh, in your career and also in your corporation. Let's take a look at the four key insights for leadership 
development executives. The first is economic uncertainty has created a sense of caution with regard to budgets. Nicola mentioned that right off the top when we were starting the presentation today. Budgets and resources for training and development are decreasing. However, the need for training and development remains important. Why are they decreasing? Because a lot of the C-suite has gone in and said, hey, we don't know how the year is going to work out 2023. Let's go ahead and cut back on budgets and be cautious. That budget's going to come back in 2024 because I believe we're going to have a soft landing if we have any sort of um, recession at all. I have felt like this has been the non-recession recession, and I won't go into the details on that, but just I think 2024 is going to be a bounce back year, assuming there's not uh, conflict around the globe uh, that uh, that uh, um, that we do. William, you wrote in the chat feature, how do organizations run counter to management? If you could expand on that, I'm going to keep reading the slides. If you could just sort of shed some light on what your uh, what the nature of your question is there. I'm not sure I understand it completely. Let's go to bullet point number three on the slides. Management is spending less time and resources on leadership training and development. However, organizations continue to put emphasis on talent development, which is terrific. Then fourth bullet point, all of this leads to an opportunity for organizations that decide to maintain or even increase their leadership development budgets. The need and demand for leadership development hasn't gone away, and organizations that meet that need will reap the benefits for years to come. And that fourth bullet point might answer William's question there. I'm not sure. Here are some key research findings. I'm not going to read every word of this slide. I'll just breeze through it. The need for training and development remains important. We found that people say that, hey, we know that it's important and valuable. We just don't have as much budget for it this year. But again, 2024, I think, is going to change that. Executive teams on the second bullet point, executive teams are less involved in talent development. So executive teams are starting to take their eye off the talent and development ball. It's your job to go in and say, hey guys, this is an important differentiator for our brand. And it's a great way to keep employees engaged and keep employees, uh, uh, attract new employees. The final bullet point, in 2023 organizations were less focused on developing the next generation of leaders than in 2022. So we're seeing this little dip. What happens after every dip? There's a correction. There's a course correction. My prediction is that in 2024, you're going to start seeing more and more organizations doing more and more leadership development. Uh, William expanded Jamie, on this. Jamie, I've got a, yeah. got a question here. Um, curious, um, what else matters with employee satisfaction uh, when organizations are going through significant change um, by change management or acquisition integration? How does that Im impact the employee satisfaction and, and what can we do about that? Yeah, most employees are afraid of change. I have a weird personality. I love change because I see it as an opportunity. But most employees are fearful of change, and that's understandable. Um, what will help alleviate that fear, that concern, that stress is an increase in employee engagement and an increase in empathy. And what I mean by that is all humans are driven by two needs. Primarily, one is the need to be respected and the need for other people to have empathy for their situation. If you can go in and engage one on one, and this can be a, a short term thing uh, where you kind of increase the engagement and you have more of those one on one conversations where you're turning to the employee and saying, I want to hear from you. What is concerning you right now? What is making you stress? Uh, and they that just getting that off their chest will relieve that stress. So if you're in an environment with a lot of change going on, the more engaged you are with your team, the better off they're going to be because it's going to give them an opportunity to express themselves. So thanks for the uh, jumping in on that, Nicola. And, and Jamie, there is another question. I think it's really pertinent to to the conversation and the results from the from the survey around you know why should organizations emphasize development when there's pressure on management to spend less, to control budgets, to push budgets out perhaps to the next fiscal year. I think I know what you're going to say, <laughs> but I, uh, please. Yeah, I love that question. Uh, and I may have a slightly different answer than you do, Nicola. So, so I'll answer mine and I'd love to hear what you have to say on that. Uh, you have, broadly speaking, you have two kinds of employees that work for you. The ones that are great and the ones that are not great. 
The ones that are great, and everybody who's a manager knows this, when you give a great employee work to do, not only that they do it on time, on budget, you know, all those wonderful things, if they're a great employee, they probably do a better job than you would have, given that you're spread very thin. The second thing is, is they probably get it done quicker than the bad employees. So the reason I mention that is your job is to get as many of those excellent employees as possible and then to spin off the not so good employees. Why is that? Because excellent employees are a differentiator for your company. They make your company more productive. They make your company more profitable. So when I started the presentation saying the World Health Organization has shown that the ROI on an investment in employee development is four to one, meaning for every dollar you spend, you generate four dollars in additional profit. That is an explanation of why, from a statistical point of view, why it works. Nicola, uh, what what is your answer to that? I'd love to hear your answer. I think it's twofold. One is that if you can increase the capacity and capability of, of the individuals in your organization a little bit, even a little bit, you're gonna you're gonna be far more successful. And so again, it's that that a dollar in to uh, development. You know, if you get four dollars of profit out, that's a fabulous, um, fabulous return. The other thing is, if you're not developing your people, there's a cost to not attracting great people. There's a cost to turnover because people will go to places where they feel that they're able to contribute and feel they're able to grow. Yeah, it's, it it is so much. You know, it's it sounds a bit gr uh, crass, but so much cheaper to actually develop people that you have. Then yeah. keep on finding new people out there. Um, so, hundred um, hundred percent agree with everything you said. And this is a good opportunity. I'm going to cut over to the overhead camera here to expand on this topic. Great question uh, from whoever asked it. But right now, hang on one second. You should be seeing my overhead camera, and what you're seeing is basically uh, a matrix I've I've developed. This is a way to think about employees. I'm about to do something that I don't want anybody to misinterpret this. Part of your job as a manager is to think about which employees are high performers versus not high performers. I'm going to do something that labels employees. I'm not saying labels are good. I'm not saying that labels stick forever, but just bear with me as I go through this to help you understand how to think about your employees. Uh, and I think I've worked with uh, uh, Dave Kenneth, who's on the call today, uh, with this to take a look at employees and, and, and kind of understand. Basically, you have employees who are low-functioning adults versus high-functioning adults. Low-functioning is they don't show up on time for meetings. They show up late. Uh, they never get their work done on time. High-functioning is uh, I get my work done on time. I'm on budget. I'm all those things. We all love these kind of high-functioning uh, employees. There are also employees with low ambition and high ambition. If you're somebody who has low ambition, that's not a negative. That just says... I don't want to be the CEO one day. I just want to, you know, come in, do a great job, work hard, but I'm going to get in at nine, leave at five, and I'm not going to work weekends or anything like that. There's nothing wrong with that. I'm just saying it's, it is a thing. And then there's people with high ambition who are hard chargers saying, I'm going to get to the top. My goal is to get to the C-suite, all that sort of stuff. If you're looking at this matrix, you kind of can think about them, uh, the employees. If, they, if you have somebody who's a low-functioning adult with low ambition, they're generally kind of like a tornado. They actually create more drama in the corporation than you want. You actually kind of want to move them off the uh off off the matrix if at all possible uh if you have somebody with low ambition who's a high functioning adult these are the people that show up on time for meetings do all the great stuff but they're again they're not their goal is not to be the ceo their goal is to do a great job those are rocks those are the people you can turn to and get jobs done and do a lot of wonderful things with them if you have somebody who is a low functioning adult with high ambition. I had somebody I consulted with who was this way. He was just somebody who didn't get the benefits of having a, a, a family unit when he was younger that was functioning, but he had high ambition. He wanted to accomplish things. He just didn't know how to get there. So I call them a work in progress. That's somebody who wants the roadmap to get to the next level, but they just don't have the tools in place. And then of course, if you have high ambition along with high functioning adult, 
you've got a star. Your goal in this matrix is to kind of spin off the tornadoes. You don't want them to get the rocks, to get the stars, and to move the work in progress as far as you can over here. And that's what leadership development training does, is it improves employees as you go on things. So that was a, a good opportunity. Let me uh, jump back to this screen right here. And you should be seeing me. If you're not, uh, somebody let me know. But I'm going to keep sharing my screen. I'm going to glance over at the uh, chat because we got a lot of engagement, which is always awesome. Great to see that. And I'm going to just see what's going on here. Um, uh, let's see. Um, uh, Denise says, with respect to your 400% return, how does that translate to or result in new suggestions? Uh, that is new work processes, suggestions, new product ideas, et cetera. Uh, you know what, uh, Denise, that's a long, longer answer. And I'm going to save that for either one-on-one -on -one or uh, you can ask Nicola that uh, directly because it, it would, it would kind of uh, slow us down. I'm going to keep going because we do have some slides I got to share here. Uh, right now on your screen, you see the key research findings we've already gone through that. Uh, but let's keep going and talk about action steps for your organization. The need for continuous leadership development is real. That is something that people need and want. And so we know that's out there. Economic uncertainty has affected budgets for training and development programs. That hopefully will change in 2024 if God help us, we don't have a war in the Middle East or, or Ukraine that expands into a, a larger conflict. Uh, and then the third bullet point, employee recruitment and retention is changing. It's your opportunity to capitalize and improve uh, on the improved ease of attracting employees by showcasing leadership development opportunities within the organization. In other words, you can use all of your leadership development training programs as a way to showcase the fact that you are a company that believes in its employees. If you would like to download the report, go ahead and grab your phones and scan this QR code. It'll take you to a blog post where at the bottom of it, you just click on it and you'll be able to download the report. It's the full report brought to you by Emory uh, Executive Education. Every year they do this and they do a great job of providing you everything you need in order to understand the details the data, the information behind that. So go ahead and scan that QR code and you'll be able to download it. In the meantime, I'm going to switch, uh, slip, uh, go to the next slide uh, right here. Uh, here's a quiz. So you thought you were off the hook, didn't you? Hey, I'm no longer in college or university anymore, but I'm going to actually quiz you. And what I want you to do is get the chat feature out and go ahead and answer these quiz questions uh, as I put them up there. First quiz question, a study by Gallup found that blank percent of employees are in engaged in their work when they have a manager who is focused on their development and well-being. See if anybody can remember that. It was a few slides ago. Dave Kenneth, look at you, a rock star student. Look at that. He's the only one that got it so far. It's 70%, unless I'm wrong, I, but I'm 99% sure that slide said 70%. Uh, my memory's never been perfect, but I think it was 70%. Greg goes in with a large percentage. Greg, that's a great answer. It's the way you can... <laughs> It's the way you answer questions on a quiz when you don't really know the answer and you just say a large percentage. A study by the World Health Organization found that companies that invest in employee well-being see a return of investment up to blank to one. Good. We've referenced that one a couple of times, so I'm glad that everybody's getting that one. Four to one. Um, a study by Bain and Company found that companies with higher customer satisfaction scores also have high blank satisfaction scores. So if they have high customer satisfaction, yes, the higher your uh, employee satisfaction, the higher your customer satisfaction will be as well. So keep that in mind as you go through this. So let's talk about the tools, tips, and techniques for effective leadership. We've now gotten all the data in us. Let's kind of look at some things that you can do in order to be a better leader as you go through. So these are some tools, tips, and techniques that I share in the workshops I do uh, with large corporations around the globe. The most important moments in your life are dictated not by what you know, but by how you think. Neil deGrasse Tyson, of course, a famous astronomer and all around great guy. But his point there is how you think dictates how you engage with the world. I'm going to tell you one thing right now that uh, if you can just jot this down, if you got notes handy, the way to be the, be the best leader you can be, when you uh, improve your thoughts, 
That will improve your actions, which will ultimately improve the outcomes in your life. So better thoughts mean means better actions, means better outcomes. Now, here's an advanced thing on the outcome side of the equation. We know that improving our thoughts is basically through study, uh, through analysis, through experience, all of that can help you improve your thoughts. Then it's up to you to change your actions based on those thoughts. Think good thoughts and you'll do good actions. When you do good actions, you have good outcomes. The challenge here is you have to release yourself of the outcome you there are too many variables to control the outcome completely so when you have good thoughts and good actions that's great it will in general improve your outcomes but you as a human being release yourself of attachment to your outcomes and it'll make your life happier buddha was one of the first people to say that he said uh, attachment is the source of all suffering when you attach yourself to i'm gonna get that promotion and you don't get the promotion you you get disappointed but if you change your mindset to i'm going to improve my actions and improve my thoughts and i'm going to release myself of whether or not i get the promotion it'll help you actually manage your stress level uh a lot better um uh, so terrific let's keep going here as we go on great stuff from neil degrasse tyson uh here's a powerful thing about the power of the mind we just talked about improving your thoughts and improving your actions there's actual data that says hey the mind is a powerful thing we all know that instinctively but let's take a look at what the data tells us researchers found that people wearing plain white coats perform better or worse based on the power of suggestion when told they were wearing lab coats subjects performed better on cognitive tests than those who were told they were wearing painters coats think about the power of that what you are telling yourself subconsciously about yourself improves your cognitive abilities if you think you're wearing a lab coat you do better on cognitive tests than if you think you're wearing a painter's coat remember that what we tell ourselves about ourselves can change the world that we live in and change our things which is why on this next slide we talk about effective worker leaders work on their mindset first and their skill set second most people think oh if i just work on my skills i'm going to be a good leader I'm going to encourage you to work on your mindset first. Think about how you think about things. Think pure thoughts, good thoughts, healthy thoughts, and keep putting those thoughts into your brain. It all depends. If you are a doom scroller, for those of you who don't know about doom scrolling, it's basically what a lot of us do. We scroll through social media or the news feed and read the doom headlines. That's an unhealthy mental practice that I have to continuously try to stop doing. But that's the kind of thing that plants negative thoughts in your brain. Negative thoughts do not lead to positive action. So change your thought process by working on your mindset first and your skill set second. Gary mentioned he has the white coat syndrome. I'm going to talk real briefly about how to fix that, Gary. I'm going to assume you're saying you might think that you are, you may be saying, I think I'm wearing a lab coat. Awesome. You may also be saying, I think I'm wearing the painter's coat. I'm going to talk to you real quickly for everybody about your first line of code. Your first line of code is like your brain is like a software program. You can have a beautiful software program that is pristine and perfect and goes a million codes deep of beautiful software code. But if that first line of code is broken, it doesn't matter how wonderful the rest of the software is, that software program will never work. So it's your job as a human being to change your first line of code. Is your first line of code, I'm not good enough? Is your first line of code, nobody likes me? Is your first line of code, the world is full of sharks? Is your first line of code something negative? If it is, you have to change it to something positive. I'm going to give you a quick technique you can do. When you start seeing that tape playing in your brain, I'm not good enough. Nobody likes me. People in this company think I'm an idiot. Whatever it is, I want you to tap your collarbones. We're about to get woo-woo here, folks. Tap your collarbones vigorously and just change the thought to the positive thought. People like me. And make it real. Um, my family loves me. Um, uh uh, I am helpful to my fellow employees. Whatever that thought is, what you're trying to do is 
jog the neural pathway and change that so that your first line of code goes from nobody likes me to I'm a happy, healthy person, whatever you want your first line of code to be. Now you're saying, Jamie, what's the stuff about tapping your collarbone? That's an actual study uh, done with people who had PTSD coming out of wars and they had them tap their collarbone as a way to reduce stress. And what it does is it jogs your neural pathways. Your brain goes, hey, what the hell's going on here with the collarbone tapping? And it gives you the ability to shift that mindset. So um, I'm gonna keep going here because we still have a bunch of slides to go through. Uh, uh, and I don't want to miss out on uh, on some of the stuff, but I'm glad Gary asked that question. Thank you uh, for that. Um, William says, is the bias against type two thinking real? William, I'm guessing you're talking about type two thinking, meaning the... Um, what I think of type two thinking is uh, is the stuff where it's the prefrontal cortex where our 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 executive reasoning in. That's what I call system two thinking as opposed to system one thinking. Uh, and maybe I've got uh, something. Maybe I've got something wrong on that. Let me keep going on the slides. I love. I am so impressed and happy that people are asking the questions in the webinar chat. I am so sorry I'm not able to get to every one of them, I, but I love the fact that you guys are so engaged. Uh, there's a, 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 a very important uh, thing uh, that I want to share with you here, which is that, uh, and I'm blanking on his name, the famous um, Jewish Holocaust survivor, somebody will remember his name, who wrote uh, man's search for meaning i'm blanking on his name somebody if you can put it in the chat feature he said uh he said the space between stimulus thank you victor frankel i just couldn't come up with it thank you the the hey andy scanlon great to see you andy the the space between stimulus and response is where you can make or break your life what victor frankel was saying there is we all get stimuli in our lives the, the if you pause and think about how you're going to react to that stimuli, that will change the outcome of your life. So what happens is, as people get stimulus, stimuli, stimulus, whichever one you want to do, plural or singular, and they react impulsively to it. Viktor Frankl realized that impulse gets in the way of success in the future. When you pause and say, what's the best way to respond to this? then you can have a positive response in all of that. So great saying from Victor, Victor Frankel. And Andy Scantlin, wonderful to see you here. Andy and I worked together for years and years and years. Wonderful, smart guy living in Denver right now, if I recall correctly. Great to see you, my friend. Uh, so uh, I'm going to tell you a wonderful story here. Uh, I'll tell you the, 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 the key idea I want to share with you right here. When you move towards comfort, your world shrinks. When you move towards discomfort, your world expands. Now, on your screen right there, you see a drawing of uh, somebody. Here's the story behind this. I'm going to tell it quickly, but it's a great story. The key point I want you to remember is that change and growth requires mild discomfort. That's a good sign. When you feel mildly discomfort about something, it's expanding your world. When you get into your comfort zone, it shrinks your world. I was at a, a class for sketching. Uh, I took one class and I said, hey, I'm going to go ahead and go down to the sketch session and get out my, my, my sketch pad and all that sort of stuff. I go to the sketch session. There's a 55-year-old naked man in the middle of the room that you're supposed to sketch like you saw in the drawing there. Great guy. Did a lot of poses. It's a very hard thing to do, believe it or not, because you got to hold still all that sort of stuff. We're around the circle, everybody's sketching. We take a pause. I go over to the guy, he puts his robe on. I go over to the guy, I say, Hey, I just want to thank you because I know it's very hard to stand still like that and you're doing a great job. I'm guessing you're an extrovert because anybody who's willing to stand naked in front of 40 people must be an extrovert. He said, No, I'm terrified every time I do this. And I said, wow, you're kidding me. I would have thought you, you just were an extrovert. He said, no, it freaks me out. I'm terrified. I hate doing it, but I'm always glad I do it afterwards. I said, well, tell me the story. He said, the first time I did it, I was in an unhappy marriage. I hated my job. I hated my life. I signed up to do this posing thing. I addressed my fears. I confronted my fears. I went out and did it. And all of a sudden I realized, wow, I confronted my fears and overcame them. It was uncomfortable for me, but I overcame my fears and I'm actually stronger for it. He said, I went in 
better or worse, he divorced his wife uh, and he quit his job. And he said, I'm so much happier now because I'm now able to confront my fears. So jumping back to that slide, let's reread it, what it says there. That story shows us that when you move towards comfort, your world shrinks. When you move towards discomfort, your world expands. Remember that, that mild discomfort is okay. Uh, here's a tip for you in meetings. What I found uh, with a lot of people that I consult with is they will say things in meetings as a leader that kind of rambles on and they don't get to the point. And so headlining and bookending is a technique where you start what you're saying with a short headline of where you're going in the meeting. Then you can ramble around and then you bookend it by saying, here's what I did. Let me give you an example. A lot of times people in meetings, you'll be having dialogues about stuff and you'll go in and you'll say, uh, you'll start talking in a meeting and you're kind of going like this. And we all do that because we're thinking out loud. But what I'm going to encourage you to do is before you start talking, try to give a telegraph to people, a headline of where you're going. Um, I think that we should explore, this is an example. I think we should explore expanding our sales force in the West Coast. And then you can ramble on about the positives and negatives of that. And then you bookend by saying, so therefore, those are the positive and negatives of expanding our workforce into the West Coast. So it's just a technique. It's a very simple technique, but it can help you be perceived more as a leader in meetings by headlining and bookending. In about three or four minutes, we're going to go ahead and uh, dive into some questions uh, that you might have on a couple of things. First of all, if any of you suffer from ADD or ADHD like I do, uh, I'm going to encourage you to meditate uh, meditation can minimize stress, increase focus, and manage ADD or ADHD. Uh, if you struggle with focus, uh, there's a couple of things you can do. There's an organization called heartfulness.org. They are a client of mine, but they're a free organization. You can learn to meditate through heartfulness.org. Or uh, you can go ahead and uh, and uh, and email me. I'll share my contact data with you later, and I'll send you a blog post I wrote on how to meditate. It's a terrific tool. A couple of other facts that I want to share with you. Under 40, you get paid for what you do. Over 40, you get paid for what you know. Remember that, that under 40, you're getting paid for what you do. Over the age of 40, you get paid for what you know. As you get older and wiser in your career, you will be paid more and more for your wisdom and your experience rather than your hands. Think of it this way. You get paid more for your brain as you get older than you do for your hands. So learn everything you can and think of yourself as a teacher as you go through your career. The more you teach others how to improve their lives, the better you'll be as a leader as you move forward. Uh, final thing here that I'm going to jump to, and then I'm going to jump to, a, we'll have some questions. So get ready if you have any questions. But I do want to mention a great quote from... Um, William uh, Warren Buffett, it takes 20 years to build a reputation, but it only takes five minutes to destroy it. Remember that as you go through your life, that building a reputation and a good reputation takes a long time. You can screw that up in just five minutes if you do the wrong things in your life. Uh, so keep that in mind as you go through this. I'm going to just share that on the screen right now. If you want to scan that QR code, it'll help you get my contact information. If you want to ask me questions about meditation that I mentioned, I'm about to turn it over to Nicola, who's going to scan the questions and we'll open it up for the Q&A session. But go ahead and scan that QR code or you can email me at jamie at jamieturner.live uh, if you're interested in more information on what we just talked about. Nicola, over to you. Thank you very much for inviting me in on this. I always enjoy it and it's so good to see so many friends in the uh, chat feature there, whether it's Dave or Andy or any of the folks that we uh, bumped into. Wonderful to see them. Yeah, absolutely. So, so thanks so much, Jamie. I do have a question about your over 40s, <laughs> being in that group. Um, yeah. I would push back on that in that today with all of that change that we're seeing in the workplace, in the, in the envir global environment, with technology, with changes in, in uh, you know, workplace practices and expectations, of customers, of employees, of, of society in general, that 
as someone in that over 40 group, I can't just rely on what I learned before. I, I, I have to oh, be yeah. able to keep learning, keep growing, keep trying new things and sort of feel like we've got to get used to being always being in that that domain of discomfort. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. My fault for miscommunicating. Uh, yeah. My intent was to say, was to actually say exactly what you're saying, which is over 40, you, you have to be a teacher. And in order to be an effective teacher, you have to continuously be inputting new and better information. So we're actually in agreement. <laughs> and, yeah, It's also not saying that over 40, you don't do stuff. You do do stuff. We all do stuff. We're all hardworking and writing reports and all that sort of stuff. But if you shift your focus over to as uh, an older, wiser leader within an organization, my job is to teach. Teachers always are inputting new information, which goes back to what Nicola said. You mm -hmm. got to have new information so that you can teach it to others and distill it and help them use it uh, properly. So I'm glad you uh, uh, clarified that. <laughs> so we do have some questions. Um, I've been sort of pulling them along the way. Um, one is, you know, what, is, what do you think of the difference between leadership development and management development? You know, I'm going to just be totally honest here. I see them as the same thing. I know the nature of that question is, how do you see it as different? Leadership development and management development is the same thing because a good manager is a good leader and a good leader is a good manager. So I, I see them as one and the same. Nicola, do you see them as one and the same or am I missing a nuance there? Oh, I see. I suppose I, I see leadership being a little bit more uh ha having more of that that vision that that strategic um perspective where are we going how do we get there thinking about how to bring the people along managing and it, to me is more about how do we do what we do today really well yeah actually good you know i'm gonna uh, again this goes back to teachers always have to continuously learn new things I'm going to take that and now have a better, more nuanced understanding of leadership versus management based on your reply there. I think that's a great one, Nicola. And thanks to whomever asked that question. That's a great question. I think it was, I think it was William Fuller, but I'm, I'm not sure. I didn't, I didn't write down people's names. Um, can you talk about the sort of long duration, the, the impact of long duration, uh, moderate, to high stress situations. So many of us have sort of felt, particularly over COVID, the pandemic, that in fact, we've been operating in a sense of, you know, fairly moderate to high stress for, for years. Yeah. Um, so what, what, any comments about the impact of that? Yeah, it's very real. Uh, and so it's incumbent upon you to do coping mechanisms designed to manage your own stress and mental well-being. I'm not saying I'm perfect at anything, but I will say that I do a lot of self-care. I meditate twice a day. I jog about every other day. Well, okay. Not every day, every other day, but but I jog two to three times a week. Uh, I am a spiritual person, so church is important to me, whether it's synagogue, church, temple, I don't mm -hmm. care, uh, as long as you have something, in my humble opinion, that that helps you kind of lean on, on a higher power. And then also other things that are all designed. There's a great YouTube video, wonderful YouTube video of a professor in a class. It's a black and white video. It's really cool. And he's holding up a uh, cup of water like this. It's, you know, like this. Hey, Dave, look, see, I'm drinking the seltzer water that you and I drink. And he's holding it up and he says, if I'm holding this, how much does it weigh? And everybody says, you know, five ounces, 10 ounces, 16 ounces, whatever it is he says. He says, if I hold this up right now, it may just be 10 ounces. If I hold it up for five hours, it feels like it's a pound. If I hold it up for a day, it feels like it's 10 pounds. He says, that's what stress does to you over time. If you're carrying stress around, it's like carrying this cup of water. And over the course of time, that stress will weigh 10 pounds instead of five ounces. So it's a great, great thing about why it's important to always use 
mental health techniques in order to do it. I do a session called From Stress to Success. It's all designed to teach people how to have that mental mental well-being so they can play the long game mm -hmm. instead of the short game. Great questions. Thank you, Nicola. Thank you so much, Jamie. I'm going to hand over to Tammy to get, to tell us a little bit more about what's coming up. Thanks, Nicola. And thank you, Jamie. A lot of great insights, as always. Um, I know people were asking about the spinning wheel. Pam actually shared the link to the spinning wheel in the chat. So if you're interested in that, please grab that there. Um, and if you had an opportunity um, to use the QR code to download the research that Jamie uh, shared this morning, I uh, hope that that provides you with a lot more insights on leadership development. Um, and to unlock the key to some additional um, insights coming up, we have um, on November the 2nd, unlocking the potential of generative AI in business, as well as the magic of TikTok, unlocking possibilities. So those are two upcoming BOB webinars that we hope that you can join us on. And December the 7th, uh, the Economy and Me Reprise 2023 in Review with Tom Smith. This is actually going to be our last Business Over Breakfast of the year. So we hope that you're able to join us on these last three uh, Business Over Breakfast webinars. And we like to also share with you upcoming courses. Um, so Jamie talked a lot about leadership today and leadership development. We have our Disrupting Your Business Strategy on November the 8th and 9th. Uh, finance and accounting for non-financial managers as well, and another leadership course that you may be interested in, Leading and Inspiring Change. And finally, we are accepting applications to our MBA level courses. This is an opportunity for you to take an MBA level course, and if you have not gotten your MBA, if you're interested in looking into our MBA programs, um, please take the opportunity to um, complete an application. Uh, for um, these courses, their in-person and virtual offerings that begin in January and go through May. Um, if you have questions about these or any of our other short courses, please feel free to email me. My email address here is located at the bottom. And we thank you, as always, for taking the time out of your busy schedule to join us today. Hope to see you all again on November the 2nd. Take care and have a great rest of your week. Bye-bye.